a welcome to A Pirate's Life for She, Swashbuckling Women Through the Ages. My name is Shichilli. I'm one of the librarians at the Ocean County Library in Toms River, New Jersey. Assisting me today is my colleague, Allison. This is a 45 minute program with a 15 minute Q&A session. Before I introduce our presenter for this evening, I want to go over some te technical aspects of using this platform, which is Jersey Connect. Please send all Q&A questions to me at chichilia-librarian by clicking on my name to the left of your screen. You can do this by pressing uh, start private message. If you have any technical issues, please click on allison-librarian and send her a private chat message. On your screen right now, you should be seeing my face and hearing my voice. When the presentation begins, you will be seeing the presenter Laura Sook Dunham's web, webcam and her presentation. The Ocean County Library was sponsorship by the Friends of the Ocean County Library, Tom's River Branch, is proud to welcome Laura Sook Duncombe, author of adult nonfiction title, Pirate Women, and young adult nonfiction title, A Pirate Slave for She, Swashbuckling Women Through History. Laura is a feminist mom lawyer author who lives with her wonderful husband and amazing sons in Tulsa, Oklahoma. When she's not pirating, she enjoys reading romance novels, belting out musical theater, and anything Star Wars related. She's a proud graduate of St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Georgetown Law, and she is grateful she gets the chance to share these powerful stories with you today. Laura will be discussing why women pirates have been largely ignored throughout history and introducing several key female pirates and sharing their stories. Thank you, Laura, for joining us today. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna turn things over to you, so. Fantastic, all right. Um, I will try to get my, my slide presentation up. Um, I want to thank um, everyone at the Ocean County Library for inviting me and getting allowing me to be a part of this and talk about pirates with you. Um, there's nothing good about this pandemic, but there, the good thing that I feel is that people are working hard to continue to share stories and connect with one another. And I'm just really honored to be able to connect with all of you. Um, and do it without um, without putting shoes on. <laughs> it's my favorite way to present. So let me get my PowerPoint up. Please stand by. All right, do we see my PowerPoint? Allison and Cecilia? I'm gonna assume that it's working, okay. We do see it. Yes, You're okay, welcome. yay, okay. <laughs> all right, so yeah, again, thank you all for coming. Um, as you can see, my love for piracy goes way, way back. Um, <laughs> there I am. So um, it's truly an honor to be able to share um, these stories with all of you. So let's get down to business. When you think about pirates, um, many things might come to mind. You could be thinking about the dashing Captain Hook, a long gun silver, or perhaps even the deliciously problematic Captain Jack Sparrow. Uh, all three of these images come from the golden age of piracy, and they all have something in common, which is that they are wrong. <laughs> um, so many things that we know or we think that we know about piracy um, are wrong, and that's part of the reason that I wrote my books, um, to share uh, the truth about piracy. So for a definition of what a pirate truly is, we're gonna have to do a little bit of math, but it's nothing to be afraid of, it's just addition. So if you have a body of water and something to steal, you have pirates. Um, this broad definition allows for the reality of all the things that pirates have been um, since the dawn of time. So um, there, here are some things right off the bat, some things that pirates are not. This is what I call like the burst your bubble section. So pirates did not bury their treasure. Um, pirates spent their treasure almost um, as soon as they had it and uh, sometimes even before so. So they didn't really have the wherewithal to you know, put away um, money in their retirement accounts. So um, the myth of buried treasure is just that, uh, a myth. 
Pirates did not make people walk the plank. Um, historians disagree where this story um, originated from. Some people believe it's sort of a misunderstanding or a mistranslation of an account of Julius Caesar, uh, who was in fact kidnapped by pirates himself. But we have no records of any male pirates uh, making their victims walk the plank. And we only have one female pirate who made her victims walk the plank. Uh, and we believe that she uh, got the idea from... Uh, Treasure Island. And that's uh, Sadie Farrell, who um, is not a part of my presentation today, but is in uh, both my books. And um, now as a pirate lover, this one breaks my heart because I, you know, talk like a pirate day is a holy day um, in my home. <laughs> but um, the Yar, Shiver Me Timbers, um, pirates did not talk like this. Um, of course, you know, that's even allowing for the broad span of, you know, uh, languages and time periods across the world, but even the golden age of piracy, pirates do not speak like that. We owe our Talk Like a Pirate Day should really be called uh, Talk Like Robert Newton Day. So this gentleman in the picture is Robert Newton, and he played Long John Silver in uh, Walt Disney's wildly successful 1950 adaptation of Treasure Island. And um, he is a fascinating character who um, is worth his own presentation, but uh, he played uh, Blackbeard as well um, and has been a pirate was a pirate many times in his career before um, dying young. Uh, but he just sort of leaned into his own um, English accent. And uh, that is what we all sort of think pirates talk like now. And that's really just, that's all Robert Newton. So those are some things um, that I just wanted to get off, um, get off my chest right away before we went forward. But it's only good news from here on out. <laughs> So here are some things that pirates did do and did have uh, in the golden age. So pirates had health insurance. Uh, before a pirate ship sailed, there would be a contract written out that every pirate would agree to that had divided up the shares of the loot. So everybody knew how much of any treasure that they found they were getting. And there were um, provisos for um, a loss of a limb, loss of an eye, um, a, a wounding. And so it was um, built in that if you got hurt while you were in the, in the service of pirating, that you would be compensated for that, which is pretty darn progressive. Um, religious and racial tolerance. Pirate ships were integrated long before the uh, legitimate navies of their day. Um, down in the Caribbean in the Golden Age, there were enslaved persons, formerly enslaved persons who joined up with pirates, um, people from all over the globe down there. And uh, no one really cared who you pray to or what color your skin was as long as you were willing to hold your own in a fight. Pirates had democratic elections. So a pirate captain was elected and during the heat of battle, his or her word was absolute. But at any other time, a crew, any member of the crew could say, you know, I'm not happy with the way that things are going and I think we need a new captain. And they held elections where any pirate among the crew could be put up as a candidate for captain. Uh, Jack Rackham, who is a pirate we'll be talking about a little bit later, he got his start. Uh, this way he won the captaincy from Charles Vane, who it was believed did not go after a French um, ship with all the ferocity that he ought to have. Gay marriage. So this is kind of mind blowing for everyone, but um, in the golden age and at other periods of time during the piracy, uh, pirates had, uh, it's a French word, the concept of metellotage. And this was a, um, a joining of fortunes. And so pirates, uh, were able to name someone as their beneficiary in the event of their death that all of their belongings and their share of the treasure would go to. And uh, this was sometimes announced with a ceremony. Sometimes it was just a written uh, contract, sometimes even just a verbal um, agreement. But um, these were uh, not always romantic liaisons in nature, but many times they were. And this was just a wild, widely accepted phenomenon during the golden age of piracy. And then perhaps the most radical thing is in the golden age of pirates, there were women in pirate crews. Uh, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, here are these two gorgeous ladies, uh, were pirating in the Caribbean during the golden age. And uh, we know, most of the things we know about them, we know from this book, uh, General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates. People frequently will just call it a general history or the general history of pirates. Uh, this book was written, published, first published in 1723, and it has not been out of print since. Uh, it has many editions in many languages, and it was written by someone. Uh, so 
Uh, it's that you may notice the cover says Captain Charles Johnson, but the naval records of the time have been searched and there's no one by that name, no one even close. So um, it's determined that it was a pseudonym. For many years, people thought that it was um, perhaps Daniel Defoe of Robinson Crusoe fame who wrote this book, but that's been pretty definitively disproven. So no one really knows who wrote this book. And the fact that this book, which is sort of the gold standard of primary source piratical research, is written by an anonymous author tells you pretty much everything you need to know about um, the difficulties in doing piratical research. Um, you know, being outside the law is kind of pirates' whole thing. Um, they didn't announce their weddings in the newspapers. They don't file tax returns. They can keep a ton of written records, so it's hard to track them down. So I always tell people, anyone who says they can tell you the truth about pirates is selling you something, um, the absolute truth. We don't know. Um, I found this quote very helpful to me as I was starting my research that the and the reality of pirate life are impossible to unravel. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's an unworthy field of study. Um, I think, you know, pirates are so astonishingly per, um, pervasive in our culture and in our myths, and they have been throughout all time. And I think what we talk about when we talk about pirates is just as important as the, you know, biographical data of, of these men and women. So here is something that we do know for sure. In every age, in every corner of the world, uh, anytime there have been male pirates, women pirates have sailed alongside and sometimes in command of these men. So why don't we know that? Why don't we talk about that? Well, there are several reasons why. The first one is explicit bias. I don't feel the need to elaborate on misogyny. Uh, some some men don't like women and they don't want women's accomplishments to be well known. Enough said. Um, there's the uh, more sort of insidious inadvertent bias. History throughout the millennia has been chronicled by men mo for the most part. And men write about the things that they know um the, and their own point of view um in my research i discovered um viking tapestries which were woven by women um and they were woven at the same time as the viking um sagas uh, the oral history was being composed so they cover the exact same uh historical deeds but they are treated completely differently and up until recently the viking tapestries were just thought of as beautiful art as opposed to a historical document so women just kind of get left out. People don't think of um, women's accounts and uh, they're not held to the same, uh, in the same esteem as male accounts. And then finally, no blogosphere. So as a writer today, I think any writer who exists at least partially on the internet has a love-hate relationship with the internet. There's Twitter, there's the comment section, and there's Goodreads, the scourge of every writer. Uh, but the internet at its best is a place where people who have traditionally been denied a platform to express themselves, to say, here I am, this is my views, this is my world, and this is the way I see things, and you can't erase me. And that did not exist until very recently. And so we don't have any blogs um, from Cheng Yi Sao or Grace O'Malley, and the more's the pity for that. So for all of these reasons we've discussed, women are often left out of history. And this is, of course, a big mistake. <laughs> so for three reasons, this is a big mistake. Uh, because when you leave out women, you leave out half of the population. You leave out half the world. So women pirate history is not just this niche subject. Women pirate history plays a role in European history, in American history, and in world history. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of these three points. So women pirate history is European history. You may have heard of this next lady. It's Queen Elizabeth I. Now, I dearly wish I was here to like blow the lid off some scandal that I found out Queen Elizabeth was actually a pirate. Um, but that's, that's not true. Uh, but she did employ them, many of them. Uh, Queen Elizabeth built the British Empire and defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588, which you know arguably changed the course of the whole world with the help of her privateers, uh, such as John Hawkins and Sir Francis Drake. 
Now, uh, if you let me put on my pedantic glasses for the moment, um, the word pirate, privateer, swashbuckler, corsair are all sort of used interchangeably and they really shouldn't be. They all mean very different things. So a privateer is an armed pri private ship licensed to attack enemy shipping and also it's used to describe a sailor on such a ship. So whereas a pirate is just a gunslinging outlaw, a privateer is more like 007. They are licensed to kill. So Queen Elizabeth um, was in need of funds to make Britain into the glorious British empire, but uh, her parliament was more like your rude aunt at your um, holiday gatherings asking, you know, when are you getting married? And they were not interested in giving her the funds she need to make her vision. So she stole them from enemy shipping um, with the help of her privateers. Uh, but not all of the privateers at this time were under Queen Elizabeth's thumb. Indeed, one female pirate went toe to toe with Queen Elizabeth and shaped the destinies of two nations, not just England, but Ireland as well. And I'm talking, of course, of Grace O'Malley. So Grace O'Malley was born around 1530 in Ireland. Uh, she was from a pirating family. So during Grace's life, um, England was slowly sort of conquesting, conquering and um, uh, domesticating Ireland from its own sovereign um, nation into uh, the property of, of England. And um, so, uh, the Irish life was hard for the native born Irish people, the Catholic Irish people, particularly during Queen Elizabeth, Protestant Queen Elizabeth's reign. So um, Irish traders were forced, traders, not traitors, were forced to sell their goods uh, far away from Ireland. They couldn't go to the ports that were controlled by the English. So um, Grace O'Malley's family spent their life making their living at sea. So um she followed her dad to the sea and the story goes that her father said you know you're you're a young lady you're not uh, welcome on her ship and so she cuts off all of her hair you know presumably with like a kitchen knife puts on a hat and is like oh hi i'm definitely a boy and i want to join your crew so um her you, know, you probably heard grace uh, referred to as granny whale um was her nickname which just means bald grace um, so her father decided that if she was so determined to go to sea that he was going to allow her to be on the ship. And it's a good thing that he did because she saved his life several times. Uh, Grace married twice. Her first husband, Donal O'Flaherty, was a uh, political marriage. And um, she sort of ruled as chieftain in his stead as he was off partying and fighting. And when he died, she assumed that she would become the chieftain in name as she had been serving it as the chieftain. Um, for many, several years. Uh, but when her um, in-laws told her that the role was going to go to um, another male relative of um, Donal who had no experience, she decided, you know, to heck with this land-loving, law-abiding life. I'm going back to my first love, um, seafaring piracy. And that's just what she did. Um, her second husband, Richard Burke, she married um, possibly for his castle, Rockfleet Castle. It was a strategic location that she needed. Um, in Breton law, the, you know, the, the Irish law, you could marry someone for one year certain and then dismiss them and then the marriage would be annulled. And so uh, the story goes that on the day of the one year anniversary, you know, Richard rode off and Grace sort of yelled out from the castle, Richard Burke, I dismiss thee. And, um, but there were no hard feelings on his side because they remained friends and, um, you know, actually raised um, their their son together um, until Richard's death. But um, she did hold, hold the deed to the castle at that point. Um, she had three sons, um, one of whom was um, captured and murdered by Richard Bingham, uh, Sir Richard Bingham, who was Queen Elizabeth's emissary, who was sent to domesticate um, Ireland. And when Bingham captured her youngest son, Tibbet, and took him to England to be tried for piracy, which would, of course, a fair trial would result in a hanging. Um, Grace decided she had lost uh, um, one too many children to um, England and Bingham, and she was not going to tolerate this. So she wrote a letter to Queen Elizabeth um, appealing for her son's life. She paints a very interesting picture of her long and uh, impressive career of piracy, painting herself as sort of a pious mother who just was looking out for her child and was only doing what she had to do to survive. Uh, and when a response did not come fast enough, she sailed to Greenwich herself, um, knowing, you know, putting her foot on English soil was uh, exposing herself to the hangman's noose as well. But she was going to do what it took to save her son. 
uh, against all of Queen Elizabeth's advisors' advice, Grace met with Queen Elizabeth. Um, rumors abound of um, what was said, what was worn, you know, who, uh, what language was spoken. And, you know, there's an, an amusing story about a handkerchief. Um, but um, no one knows exactly for sure what happened um, in the room where it happened. But at the end of the conversation, Grace was allowed to go home with her son and continue um, her life of piracy while Bingham was eventually recalled to England in disgrace. So it just goes to show what you can accomplish when uh, smart women put their heads together. And uh, Grace died at home in, at 1603, the same year as Queen Elizabeth. So here's a picture of Rockfleet Castle. Uh, doesn't look like much now, but um, uh, there are worse things to get married for, I think. And uh, also, uh, it, as I mentioned, it is strategically located. So it was a good a good fortress for her, for her um, pirating ventures. And here is a woodcut uh, created around the time of the meeting of the Pirate Queen and the Virgin Queen. So that's Grace on the left and Queen Elizabeth on the right. So women pirate history is also American history. Um, and when I say America, I speak of, you know, not only North America, but South and Central America. So uh, the golden age of piracy happened in the Caribbean. Um, and so when you think of the Caribbean, you probably think of this sort of pirates of the Caribbean. And uh, I wouldn't blame you. Um, indeed, my own love of piracy was certainly augmented by frequent visits to this amusement park ride as a young, uh, impressionable lass. But the Pirates of the Caribbean were so much more uh, than, than this charming ride. And people ask me all the time, why the Caribbean? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. The first is um, political. So uh, when Spain was granted most of the New World by the Pope, um, everybody wanted a chunk of the Caribbean for their own. Only nobody actually wanted to go there. Um, the Caribbean is not a place that you went if you had a better place to go. It was hot. It was uncivilized. There was a lot of disease. And so it was not a place where you actually wanted to be, but you wanted to own it. So um, the, the colonies changed hands very quickly. And um, no governor, until Woods Rogers came, um, was able to sort of assert themselves and... Um, lay down the law in any meaningful way. So the, the political instability coupled with the triangle trade. So um, the sad and shameful fact is if there was not um, uh, slave trade in the Americas, there would be no Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, but, you know, the triangle trade is, you know, goods from Europe go down to um, collect persons and enslave them, take them over to the Caribbean, and then you take the raw materials, you know, sugar, tobacco, and rum back to Europe. And this is this triangle. And um, where all of these goods and people are being moved, there's a lot of money involved. And where there is money, there is pirates. So where the money plus the political instability created this perfect storm where, you know, pirates outnumbered law-abiding citizens uh, at various points in Nassau, like two to one. And um, we had this sort of confluence of pirates that um, we, you know, um, from like 1650 to 1720, um, that uh, would just, has has not happened again. I remain hopeful, but uh, the golden age of piracy was sort of never before and not since. So uh, two of the most famous, um, currently most famous female pirates of all time were active during this era. Um, we talked about the little before, uh, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. So Mary Reed was born in England around 1690, and um, her mother was getting money from her mother-in-law for um, to care for the grandson, Mary's brother. Well, when Mary's brother died, um, Mrs. Reed was going to be cut off. So she hatched a sort of desperate plan to dress Mary up like a boy and pass her new baby, Mary, off as her um, her brother. So um, for some reason, this worked. Um, I guess grandmother didn't visit a lot. Um, no one was checking too closely. But so Mary, for most of her life, was dressed as a boy and passed off as her dead brother. And um, she kept this up through her next, like, three jobs. She was a footman, she was in the army, and she was in the Navy. Um, she married a fellow soldier. Um, the story goes, they shared, shared a tent and sort of fell in love. And um, her you know, future husband was incredibly relieved when, you know, she opened her blouse and was actually a woman underneath all that. And the, uh, the, her, their fellow soldiers like threw them a bridal shower and, you know, they were both honorably discharged and they set up um, a tavern 
in a Breda, Holland, um, present day Holland. But um, tragedy struck. Uh, Mary's husband died and the business dried up. Um, in peacetime, there's not a lot of, you know, movement um, through this, these taverns frequented by soldiers in times of war. So as a woman without options, she went to the West Indies. Um, and who knows what would have happened to poor Mary if her ship had not been hijacked. Um, and whenever it was determined that young Mark um, had a lot of sailing and fighting experience, he was immediately conscripted by these pirates. So this is where Mary meets up with Anne Bonny um, in a, as luck would have it, and as truth is stranger than fiction. And I mean, we have uh, documents that prove that these women were sailing together. We have trial transcripts, we have newspaper articles from the time period. So a lot of things we can't prove, but we do know that these women were sailing together. And it's like how in the whole Caribbean that they found each other, but it happened. So um, Anne Bonny was born in Ireland, um, daughter of a wealthy lawyer and his wife's lady's maid. So uh, when the infidelity was discovered, um, William Cormack moved his mistress and young daughter in disgrace to America to start a new life. And they were in the Carolina colonies. Um, shortly after arriving, uh, the maid, uh, Peggy, died and Anne became mistress of the whole uh, plantation. And boy, did she have a temper. Um, there are stories of her, you know, stabbing servants with silverware and... Um, a man was once too uh, too fresh with her and she beat him so savagely that he was laid up for weeks. So she's not someone you want to um, not have on your side. In other words, um, a beautiful young woman with a very wealthy father would have no shortage of um, suitors, eligible suitors, but uh, instead of picking any of the reasonable men her husband or her father paraded before her, she married small time sailor James Bonney and broke her father's heart, who disinherited both of them in short order. Um, by all accounts, James only married Anne for her fortune, so he was uh, despondent that his ploy had not worked out. And so the unhappy newlyweds, uh, again, with no prospects, moved to the Caribbean where James decided he was going to try his hand at pirate hunting. Um, Governor Woods Rogers uh, of the Bahamas was paying cash for pirates um, who either turned themselves in or someone who turned pirates in. And James thought this was a way to make a quick buck. So he started frequenting the pirate hangouts um, and sort of foolishly brought his wife along with him. And then Anne met Jack. So Calico Jack Rackham is a really interesting character. He um, sort of like the Kanye of his day, you know, very fashionable, like like to wear really ridiculous clothing. Like when you think of like a fancy pirate, like a Captain Hook kind of thing, that's probably based on Jack Rackham. Um, and he was a good pirate, but not a great one and would probably be lost to history if not for his association with Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. Um, but when Anne met Jack, they fell instantly uh, in love and they would remain together um, till, uh, till their deaths. And um, uh, the story goes, you know, that Jack wooed her like he took a prize, like all guns blazing and no quarter given. So um, pretty quickly she ran off with him. Um, she got pregnant and um, Jack offered to buy her off of James, her husband, which was apparently a common practice at the time. But uh, James, for some reason, turned down the money and um, instead uh, reported them to Governor Rogers, who um, who ordered them whipped for adultery. So that was sort of the beginning of their legal uh, contact with Governor Woods Rogers, um, which would which would not end well. But kind of the clock starts ticking at that point. So Anne and Jack run off to Cuba. She has the baby. Um, no one knows what happens to the baby. Maybe the baby dies. Maybe the baby, you know, was given to someone in Cuba. So um, there could be people living in Cuba today who are descendants of um, like the world's greatest pirate power couple um, that don't even know, which just, you know, delights and fascinates me. Um, so... Um, and then at some point after, you know, the baby's born, they pick up Mark Reed and Anne and Mark become very close to the point where Jack is, you know, jealous of all the time that Anne is spending with Mark. And, you know, they're kind of like, oh, for heaven's sakes, Jack, like you have nothing to worry about. You know, she's also a girl. Um, so the three of them are thick as thieves and um, have various adventures throughout the summer and fall of 1720, uh, including uh, probably the most noteworthy is the theft of the Sloop William, uh, which is an English ship right out of Nassau Harbor under 
Governor Rogers' nose. So if he is not happy before, he's definitely not happy now. And he issues, you know, warrants for the arrest of all three of them, Anne, Jack, and Mary. Um, so the, um, uh, they are captured finally in October of 1720. Um, the story goes that Anne and Mary are up on deck keeping watch while the men are all downstairs playing cards, drinking, sleeping when um, their boat is hailed. So Anne and Mary know like this is the end. So they're calling down to the hold, you know, come help us. We have to fight. Like, you know, we're fighting for our lives and nobody comes up. Everybody's either too drunk or too scared or whatever. And um, Mary even like, you know, shoots her gun off down the hold a couple of times. Like somebody come up here. Um, and nevertheless, they managed to kill an impressive number of people before um, they are all finally captured. So um, the men are tried first. Um, Jack, uh, they're, they're found unsurprisingly guilty of piracy. And um, Jack Rackham is sentenced to hang. Uh, so the night before his hanging is to take place, he asks for one final uh, goodbye with his love. And um, they grant this request and take him to Anne. Uh, and then Anne you know, looks him in the eye and says that he's so she's sorry to see him there. But if he had fought like a man, he would not now have to die like a dog. So you've got to love that stone cold burn, you know, and um, I, I like to think, you know, personally that Jack knew Anne and he knew that she would not be, you know, weeping prettily into a handkerchief and, you know, saying like, be brave, my love. And uh, I hope that he went to the gallows smiling. Um, the place where he was hanged and then put on display in the Bahamas is still called Rackham's uh, Key to this day. So uh, then Anne and Mary are tried. Um, several witnesses testify to the fact that they, uh, you know, the women were definitely a part of all of the piratical goings on. Um, you know, the judge is really like bent over backwards to be like, well, but is it possible that you were kidnapped and you weren't really a pirate and you didn't want to do these things? You know, they didn't know quite what to do with these women pirates. Um, but the the witnesses refuted that pretty conclusively you know they said like no they were out there they were swearing they were cutting people they had guns and that at one point um when these people were let go that the women suggested you know we should kill them because if we ever get captured they would testify against us and so it turned out you know you should you should have listened to these women and so they were also convicted of piracy um, after their sentences, they were both, um, they said they were pregnant, they were examined, they were found to be pregnant, so their sentences were commuted uh, until they gave birth. So Mary uh, dies in uh, dies in prison a little bit later, um, possibly of um, childbed fever, you know, we think complications during childbirth, whereas Anne disappears. Uh, we don't really know what happens to Anne Bonnie. There are a couple of theories. Um, one is that her father, you know, um, overwhelmed with grief, uses his money and political connections to spring her and that she goes home to the Carolina colonies to live out her days. This is my least favorite theory because I think Anne would have definitely rather ended her life at the end of a noose than, you know, sitting in a parlor um, doing needlework for the rest of her life. Um, another theory is that she escaped on her own. Another theory is that um, another pirate crew um, sprung her from jail and she just went on to pirate um for the rest of her days. And so um, we'll probably never know. So you can think whatever, whatever you like. Uh, but besides these two incredible women, there is a sneaky instance of um, pirates in uh, no less of a lofty institution than the United States Marine. So you see the song from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. You may have had to learn it in choir. Um, I certainly did. Um, when they say the shores of Tripoli, they mean pirates. So the Barbary Corsairs, who are known throughout history as the most dangerous, terrifying, ruthless, you know, I mean, Barbary, this is the word barbarous, barbaric, it's all the same root, and it's, um, uh, comes from these, these pirates. Um, and they, you know, terrorized everyone, including the American colonies. And, you know, you had to pay them off so they didn't come and invade you. So uh, right after the Revolutionary War, President Thomas Jefferson, well, not right after, obviously, he was not the first president. Um, Jefferson decided they did not have enough money to continue paying this uh, protection money to the Barbary pirates. So he um, beefed up the Navy to end the Barbary menace. Um, a lot of people say that um, the U.S. Navy was created to fight the pirates. That's not exactly true. Um, but 
the Navy, as we know it, sort of the birth of the modern Navy comes from this um, this uh, this uh, attack against the Barbary pirates. But many years before our man TJ, um, there was a legendary female Corsair named Saida Alhara. So this brings me to my final point, women pirate history is world history. Um, so Saida Alhara, we don't know her name. Um, it's a title that says noble lady who's free and independent. Um, but I can't think of anybody who embodies this title more. Um, she was born in Andalusia. It's a modern day in Spain, 1485. And her family um, was um, chased out of Spain um, by Ferdinand and Isabella during the Reconquista. Um, so her family went to Morocco as a child. As they they uh, they fled as refugees, uh, but they never forgot the um, the indignities um, that their family suffered um, as a result of the Spanish. Um, so um, she married Abu Hassan al Mandri, the governor of their new home of Tetuan. Um, he was a great deal older, so it was not a love match, but he certainly um, they respected each other and held each other in high regard. And as he advanced in age, he leaned on her a lot. Um, to handle the day-to-day -day governance of, of Tetuan. And uh, eventually when he died, she took over as the sole uh, governor of Tetuan and she held that title for a very long time. Uh, but she wanted to make Tetuan into this flourishing, beautiful place and she needed money for that. And so she teamed up with the Barbarossa pirates, you may have heard of them. Um, and together they sort of covered the entire Mediterranean Sea. Um, they were the terrors of the Mediterranean. And um, they captured money. We know largely about Saida from the records of the Spanish and Portuguese who said, you know, Saida Alhura attacked us again. Um, so she exists in their records. And um, there are, uh, Tetuan is a UNESCO World Heritage Site now uh, in Morocco. And some of the things that are still there um, are things that her money paid for, um, things that she built. So um she really, you know, was able to fulfill her dream of making Tetuan a beautiful place um, by taking money out of the pockets of the people who had made her flee there. Um, later in her life, she married the Sultan um, of Fez, Ahmed Watazi. And um, it's the only time in Moroccan history, this is the other place where you see Saida pop up in history books, um, where the Sultan left the capital for the wedding. Um, you know, traditionally the wedding was a lot of pomp and circumstance in the capital, but Saida said, you know, like, fine, yes, I'll marry you, but you have to come to me because I've kind of got my own governing thing going on. So um, he did, and then they sort of went back to doing what they were doing before their wedding. I mean, he returned to Fez and she kept governing Tetuan um, until she was dispo or deposed, by her son-in-law who sort of saw the way that the, the wind was blowing in Morocco um, and um, the, the change of um, um, dynasties that was coming and he wanted to get in on the right side. So he took um, he took Saida's place and um, she disappears in history completely in 1542. So this remarkable woman who had held uh, governorship of her town um, for so long and married the Sultan um, just kind of disappears off the map. Um, I want to talk a little bit about ships for you. Um, I think when people think about pirate ships, and I mean, even when I still think about pirate ships, they think about the ship on the right. Um, that's a French ship. Um, but the the Corsairs had um, these smaller, these little gal these galley ships. So um, yeah, there's a, that's the Barbary ship. And um, I want you to see the oars there. So these ships were smaller and faster and easy, more maneuverable against the big ships. Um, pirates, you know, they don't, normally have the firepower of the legitimate navy so they have to be fast because they have to be able to get in and get out of the way and easy to maneuver so pirate ships change over time i mean based on um the location and the needs of the pirates as well as um the, the shipbuilding technology as ships continue to evolve but um so you know while some pirate ships certainly look like the pirates of the caribbean pirate ships it's really just a small fraction of the ships that pirates um are using um, so, you know, they would be a lot faster against um, the English galleons. Um, speaking of England, when you think of England, um, you might think of something sort of like this. Um, I know I do. Um, and no, Maggie Smith, to my knowledge, is not a pirate, although her son um, plays a pirate, um, plays Captain Flint in the excellent star series Black Sails. So there's a fun parenthetical connection there. Uh, but the English love of tea specifically Chinese tea, um, created the circumstances which allowed for the rise of the greatest pirate of all time. Um, yes, you heard that right. And that is Chang Yi Sao. So um, England imported Chinese tea um, with a mania that just money was 
pouring out of England in, into China to import Chinese tea. So England wanted to have an export of their own that could sort of compete and tip the money scales back in their favor. So they uh, chose to export opium to China. So the Opium Wars is kind of a long story <laughs> that I uh, am not going to go into here, but suffice it to say that the political instability that they caused um, was sort of the forge that um, grew um, Chang'e Sao. So here is a woodcut uh, that we believe is of her, which is much better than the other um, depiction we have of her, which is in... Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Um, and incidentally, the fact that there was a pirate named Mistress Ching in Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, Pirates 3, um, is probably the most historically accurate thing in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Um, I love those movies, all of them, um, but historical documentaries, they aren't. Um, so Cheng Yi Sao was born in present day Canton around 1775. So as America is sort of coming into into form, so is so is Cheng Yi Sao. Um, Cheng Yi Sao is also not her real name. Um, it means wife of Cheng Yi. So we have no idea what her name was either. Um, she worked on a flower boat as a teenager. So these were um, floating brothels. So China at this point is very isolationist. They don't want the foreigners with whom they're trading to actually set foot on their soil. So a lot of business is done on boats. And you know when work is done, uh, it's time to play. And so they had these um, floating brothels. Um, so Cheng Yi works there and marries one of her clients um, in 1801. The story goes, you know, he's so besotted with her that he says, you know, uh, please marry me. And she says, well, if you give me half of your fleet, I will. Um, this is an apocryphal story. But uh, regardless, they do get married and they honeymoon in Vietnam where they are paid soldiers for the Tay Song Rebellion. And even though their side is unsuccessful, they learn in Vietnam that uh, one pirate ship is great, but two pirate ships working together is twice as good. And, you know, a fleet is even better. So they come home from Vietnam with this idea to build this pirate confederacy, um, which they do um, slowly and carefully um, up until 1807 when Chang Yi dies. So at this point, the pirate empire could have dissolved or, you know, some other person could have stepped up to take it over. And um, the person who does that is his wife, Chang Yi Sao. So this is kind of unprecedented for a woman to take over a business of this magnitude, um, but she does it very smartly. And the first thing she does is she appoints Chang Pao, who's her adopted son, um, as the commander of the Red Flag Fleet. So they have the Red Flag Fleet, the Green Flag Fleet, the Black Flag Fleet. Um, that's the hardest part of the presentation, by the way, saying Black Flag Fleet. Um, and um, the Red Flag Fleet is their biggest fleet. It's their central fleet. So she's got someone who's completely obedient and loyal to her in every way in charge of the, the bulk of her fleet. Um, then she establishes a code of laws. So many uh, pirates have code of laws. Bartholomew Roberts is known for having a, a pretty interesting one. But hers is very special uh, because she punishes the rape of female captives with death. Um, this was not necessarily about any love of women, but about power. Um, she wanted her her crews to be completely loyal to her and um, no one was having any fun unless she said so. So most of the offenses, even minor ones, were punished by death, um, but they were obeyed. Her word was law because she was so fantastically, fanatically successful. Um, when I said that pirates didn't bury their treasure, that is true, but Chingy Sao had to sort of build banks um, on shore. They had so much money coming in that they had um, they had to keep it on land. They kept accounts of it on land. Um, at the height of her power, she had 40,000 to 70,000 pirates under her command and somewhere around 1,200 ships. Um, Blackbeard, at the height of his zenith, had like every single metric you can think of to define success as a pirate. You know, how long they were active, how much money they got, how many people they had under their command. You know, whatever you think of to measure how good a pirate was, she is the best of every pirate in the whole world of all time. Um, and yes, her, her, her her navy was larger than the legitimate navies of the time, including the Chinese navy, who was completely powerless to stop her. Um, there are many times where they made, uh, you know, they made plays to stop her. At one point, she was 
Um, they had her blockaded. They had her, one of her fleets blockaded and they kept them there for seven days and they're, you know, firing on them from a distance. And um, people are coming down to like the beach and setting up chairs. You know, they're going to watch this historic end of Cheng Sao finally, you know, because people were terrified of her. I mean, commanders were like committing suicide when she was coming rather than be captured by her. I mean, she's just absolutely terrifying. And, um, so she's being blockaded. Everyone is like rubbing her like, yes, finally, we'll take her down. And so they have the, the piece de resistance, which is the fire ship, which is exactly what it sounds like. You light a ship on fire and you sail it into the other side's lines because all the ships are made of wood. And so this fire ship, you either have to try to get out of the way or your whole you know fleet goes down in flames. Well, the wind comes and turns the fire ships around and sails them right back into the Chinese Navy. They're scattering and Chingy Sao and her fleet escapes um, completely unscathed. So um, she was a mighty, magnificent force to be reckoned with and no one on earth could stop her. Um, so, and she knew it. So she negotiated with the government uh, to be able to retire when she wanted to get out. She thought, you know, get out when the going's good. And she went to the government with a list of demands knowing she absolutely held the upper hand because uh, they were powerless to counter. They had nothing to counter. So she got everything she asked for, which was she got to keep all her money. She got pardons for virtually all of her men. She got a spot in the real Navy, uh, the legitimate Navy for Cheng Pao. And she got to keep a fleet of her own ships for her own personal use. So uh, her surrender alone is um, impressive on a scale unlike anything that we've ever seen in piracy. You know, most pirates ended their life um, at the end of a rope or at the business end of a cannon. And she died at home in bed, um, you know, um, with her with her fleet still around her. So um, Ching Yi Sao is the reason that I wrote my first book. I said that, you know, women should be dressing up like Ching Yi Sao and then reluctantly allowing their brothers to play pirates too. But like the best pirate ever is a woman and people don't know about that. And so by gosh, I'm going to tell everyone. And that's what I've been doing. Um, so she died um, at age, of old age in 1844. We don't know exactly what she did after she left the sea. Some people say she started a brothel. Some people say she started a casino. Um, I hope she died, you know, doing something like this, you know, rolling around in piles of money because gosh darn it, she deserved it. Um, but wait, there's more. Uh, there's not much more of this presentation, but there are so many more pirates um, that I have not talked about. There's 30 of them in um, my in my books, Pirate Women and Pirate's Life for She. So um, my hope is by sharing these stories that it will um, allow you to open your eyes and uh, just be aware of the pirate stories that are all around us because we continue to discover them tucked into other stories all the time. Um, you know, women are, it's like, you know, male pirate and wife or like, you know, pirate and criminal. And then you realize, like, wait a minute, those women are pirates. They're just not calling them pirate women. Um, because I think these stories are important. Um, these women chose their own destiny. They were told, you know, this is what a woman can be and this is what your life is going to be like. And they all rejected that. Um, I think every woman knows, um, has been told, you know, this isn't something you're allowed to want. This isn't allowed to have. Um, and these pirates just said, no, oh, thank you. Um, we're going to do it our own way. Uh, I think it's not too big of a leap to go from pirate stories to, you know, Catherine Johnson, who took us to the moon, Alice Guy Blachey, the first um, female film director, and even the late, great, notorious RBG. Um, and uh, every, every woman, every person, uh, deserves to have a role model who inspires them to go after what they desire, um, no matter how much other people tell them they can't have it. And it is my hope that these pirate women can be that inspiration for other women in the way that they are for me. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Laura, for that amazing presentation. Um, we're going to open things up to Q&A. So if you could send me any of your Q&A questions, Shachalia Dash Librarian, just click start private chat message. I'll read some out loud. And please do, because it's so weird to do this without an audience. Like I know you were there, but no one was laughing at my jokes and that made me very <laughs> sad. So I would love to hear some, um, some questions. Let's talk. We have Laura who said, thank you to the author and to the Ocean County Public Library for this event. This was so interesting. I want to ask if the author has thought about writing a book about rebellious land-based ladies. Oh, 
I I have thought about it. Um, I um, I have not I have not yet put anything substantial together. There's so many. It's hard because you know a lot of the outlaws they don't they're not quite as fun. It's like this person's a bank robber. Other than you know Bonnie and Clyde, like we don't have a lot of like criminals that inspire me in the same way. <laughs> they're not quite as fun as the pirates, but. I thought about writing about women pilots for a long time. I've been, you know, kicking around a lot of things, but there are so many incredible women in our history that whose stories have not been told. And it has been my great joy as I tell these stories to hear about other women and to read stories about other women. You know, hidden figures was not a thing when I wrote this book. And I had thought about writing about those women. And then, you know, a little book you may have heard of called Hidden Figures came out that like did okay, I guess. So um there are many more people more talented than myself telling these these stories of other women. So maybe maybe you should write one. Okay, another question. Early in the presentation, it was mentioned that people of all races were pirates. Were are there any accounts of Native American pirates? I have not come across one, um, but that does not mean that they are not there. Um, I'm sure that there were. Um, there's a historian who says, you know, at a certain point in the British Navy, there were so many women serving that they should have had their own battalion. I mean, we only know about the pirates who got caught. So I am 100% certain that there were many, many, many women pirates who lived and died as men and nobody ever knew who they were. So um, I have to say with regret, not yet, but that's just my own limited knowledge and imagination. Uh, not imagination, my own limited knowledge of, of women pirates, but I'm sure there were Native native ones. Did pirates continue to practice religion while they were pirates? Did they observe religious holidays? That is a good question. I have not read much about, certainly not like Judeo-Christian pirates. Um, Chengi Sao was said to be devoted to um, her Chinese spiritualism. She had idols on her ship that she, um, you know, made, um, left things to and like prayed to um, before big battles. Um, and that's the one that, that pops up in my head. But I don't think, um, you know, I don't think they had off for, for Christmas um, um, very often. But um, I don't think there's there's not usually a lot of sailing going on at, at Christmas because it's, it's too cold. So um, but that's a great question. I don't I don't know um, definitively. Any current pirates or current women you think of as pirate like? Oh, man. Um, I have to admit, I don't know a ton about the current, um, most of the seafaring piracy right now is the Somali pirates and that sort of stuff going on over there. And I don't know of any women in that group, um, but women who are pirate, like I would definitely say um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I think she is definitely a pirate um, because she, you know, she took a seat that people said that she shouldn't have. And now she's doing a lot of things that people say that she shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, she's too young and, you know, so, um, I think any woman um, who is in a male dominated arena kicking butt um, is, is a spiritual pirate, if not an actual pirate, so. I thought true historic pirates were ruthless hurting their enemies and such. Were the female pirates that way as well? Yes, they were. Um, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing when, when we talk about pirates and you know, my second book of Pirates Life for She is aimed at young people. And so, I mean, it is, it's a weird distinction, right? Because they are technically bad guys, you know, they're stealing and murdering and things of that nature. Although not all of them murdered, you know, we have several gentlemen pirates um, who would steal money, but then leave, you know, leave people off on the shore. Um, uh, but um, they, um, the women by all accounts were just as um, you know, bloodthirsty and, you know, shooting and stabbing. There's a, there's a, a pirate who's not in my presentation, um, Maria Cobham, who just like loved murder. Like she was just really into murdering people in like strange ways, like poisoning and like cutting off pieces of their body while they're tied to the mass. Like she just was like really into murdering people. Um, you know, just like the whole spectrum of humanity, like you've got, you know, people who like things and people who don't like things. I mean, in pirate, there's no, there's no one thing that defines a woman pirate other than her desire to escape the life that she's supposed to be living. So um, 
I don't, I've never seen any account that women pirates were somehow less bloodthirsty or less involved in all aspects of piracy. In fact, we have testimony from people who had been captured by Anne Bonny and Mary Reed that they were, um, you know, swearing and cutting and stabbing and doing all of the things that male pirates were doing. So they certainly had an equal um, place in, in the pirate hi hierarchy. I hope that answers your question. Someone just asked to repeat the name of the pirate you just talked about. Oh, um, Maria. Um, sometimes some people call her like Mary, but it's usually she's Maria Cobham, C-O-B-H-A-M. And you can read about her in um, a pir um, Pirate Women. I think I left her out of the young adult book because she is like what makes her special is her deep love of creative murder. Um, and I thought that wasn't a great <laughs> model for the young people, but she's definitely in a pirate's life or um, in pirate women. What is your favorite pirate film? Oh my goodness. Um, I mean, you gotta, you, I, this is so hard. I mean, I love all the Pirates of the Caribbean ones. I love them all deeply. I actually think Pirates, the fifth one, is one of the best ones. Um, I love Cutthroat Island, the horrible Gina Davis one, like the one that was so bad, it sunk her career and the entire movie studio that made the movie. Um, but um, I, I have to say, I love, and it's not a movie, but Black Sails, the Stars series, Black Sails, I think has some of the most accurate depictions of piracy. And I generally love what they do with Anne Bonny. I think there's a little character assassination towards the end, but um, I think that that's, if you're looking for something that's like pretty accurate, um, Black Sails is really wonderful. Although it is very, very bloody and um, bad languagey and not for young people. Um, <laughs> if you if you are looking for family friendly entertainment, look elsewhere. But I I have a deep and um, abiding love for Black Sails. What are some of the sources that you use to write your books? That is an excellent question. Um, I was living in DC at the time um, and I did a lot of research at the Library of Congress. Um, I did a lot of digging um, there. Um, I did a lot of um, oral history. Like I spoke to a lot of people um, across the globe who had, you know, had these stories been passed down. Um, one of my favorite experiences was there's a woman in Pirate Women called Gunpowder Gertie who was a Canadian pirate um, who is actually completely made up by a teacher but accidentally reported as news on like Good Morning Canada. Um, and they had like a whole story on her. And then someone told them like, hey, by the way, like that's not real, a teacher made that up. Um, so I spoke to the teacher who like took out her like big cardboard box of all of her materials. And she was like reading me some of the stuff that she had written. Um, you know, like I said, um, pirate, um, Pirate research is not like well bound. Um, you know, um, Diane Murray, who does um, research on Chengi Sao, she's like really the, the giant upon whose shoulders I, I stand. You know, she had done incredible, you know, translation work and um, finding, you know, discovering of Chengi Sao. Um, Anne Chambers wrote the, the definitive biography of Grace O'Malley. Um, and um, those weird little books you find in gift shops in the Caribbean. You know, when you're in the Caribbean on vacation and you see like next to the like Jamaica Me Crazy t-shirts, like a little rack of like three dusty books. And you're like, who would ever buy those books like on vacation? I would buy them um, and I have a large collection of them. And so it's a lot of like local lore. Like these are the pirate stories that we tell here on this island. Um, and so while those are not, you know, a historical gold standard. Some of these pirates only live on in these local legends. And so um, that's that's kind of how I did it. What was the most interesting thing you learned during your research? Oh my gosh, so many things. I have to say, honestly, I was, I was mostly surprised by the things I learned about Vikings because I knew the least about them, but I chose to include them in the book um, because I thought that, you know, they're seafaring, um, so they're frequently lumped in with pirates anyway, and they were women who went against the traditional mores of the time. Um, and just learning sort of about life on a Viking uh, ship and the way that the Vikings lived, and also the Viking tapestries, just the idea that like women were recording history um, and they were recording it in their own way. You know, they examined, I, I read like um, an, an academic paper that was examining like one of the Viking sagas and like 
it was the same story, but it was told from like the male point of view in the saga and then in the female point of view in the tapestry. And it was like different events of the story were highlighted. And it was just like really mind blowing to me, just the idea that there's so much that we've missed um, that, and so much that remains to be discovered um, that women have been telling their stories since time immemorial, but we just don't know, we don't always look for it because we don't know where to look. So I have just two more questions and then we'll close okay. out for today. Um, someone asked, who is your favorite character in Black Sails? <laughs> uh, I, I have to, I have a soft spot for Charles Vane and that's, that's like, that's upsetting to admit because it should be Jack Rackham and dear God, do I love Jack Rackham, but I found myself falling in love with Charles Vane in a way that I never had before because of Black Sails. He's just, you know, he's, he's like a Hufflepuff. He's just, he's so loyal and just like, you know, simple minded, uh, not simple, but it was uh, focused on his, on his, um, on his goals in a, a very like Hufflepuff way. Um, and you don't have a ton of pirate Hufflepuffs. And so I'm, I'm like all in on, on Charles Vane. And last question, uh, who is your favorite female pirate? Oh, this is like asking me who's my favorite child. So this, this answer changes like every day, ask me again tomorrow. Um, but today, because I've been thinking about her a lot, I've been working on a project involving her. I would have to say Grace O'Malley um, because she was a working mom pirate. Um, you know, she had her sons like on the ships with her. Her son Tibbet was born at sea. Um, and as a working mom myself, trying to juggle the demands of motherhood and a career, um, I just, I like sort of imagine Grace a lot of times with like a baby on her hip and like a sword in her other hand. And like, that just sort of is like, you know, like hashtag mom goals for me. And so um, Grace O'Malley is always going to be in my top five. All right. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, Allison has put links to Laura's books on our catalog in the chat. If you wanna save that link, um, you can find any other programs at the Ocean County Library on our YouTube page or on our website, theoceancountylibrary.org. Thank you I'm again. I'm pretty Laura. findable on the internet as well. Like if, if your question was not answered, like I exist on Twitter, although I've been on a hiatus recently because a book that I've been waiting to come out for for several years has people are spoiling it. So I have not been on Twitter, but after Tuesday, <laughs> I'll be back on Twitter and I will answer all your pirate questions. So it's just my name. It's like at Laura Duncombe one. Uh, but sorry, I didn't mean to, you were talking about your library. No I just want to make sure if people had <laughs> questions, I have yeah. answers for you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, feel, feel free to ask Laura. <laughs> Okay, everyone, thank you again for coming. Uh, hopefully this will be up on YouTube later if in case you want to go back and watch it. Technology again, timing. Again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks again for coming. Thanks for having me. Support public libraries. Like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.